And now you might call this a word from our, one of our sponsors about Bermuda College. Bermuda College is the only tertiary institution on the island. We offer 20 degree programs and have articulation agreements with more than 30 institutions in the UK, US, and Canada. Students can transfer all of their credits and complete their bachelor's degree in two years. So it is an education of quality, it is cost effective, time effective, and how many of you have sent your children away to school for university? Show of hands, please. Yes? So you will know that you spent many hours and much money on application forms to numerous institutions, and you waited not knowing which institution would say yes, and that was a moment full of angst. But here at Bermuda College, with our partnerships, we take away that uncertainty, because if your child goes to one of our partner institutions, they're guaranteed acceptance. I must also say that many of our institutions prefer to have students who come from Bermuda College with that associate's degree because they've already negotiated the transitional issues of the beginning of college life and they've had the experience of taking college courses. Um, I've worked at or attended some of the best universities in the world and I can tell you that Bermuda College is definitely on the map when it comes to community college education. So, Send your children to Bermuda College or come to Bermuda College to further your education dreams and your career goals. Start your future here. On to our conference. When in the spring of 2018, uh, the Bermuda College Journal, which is called Voices in Education, held an event with Dr. Clarence Maxwell on Bermuda's history, we became acutely aware of the level of interest that we as Bermudians have in this subject understanding our history. The auditorium was packed, and I know some of you were at that event, so you can attest to that. And at the end of Dr. Maxwell's talk, the kind of questions that he received indicated a true hunger for knowledge, to understand our past, to understand our experiences, and to be able to relate th this understanding to our current ways of being. I certainly thought that, and clearly others did as well. It was an easy decision when given the opportunity to collaborate with the Human Rights Commission and Oxford University when they came to meet with me last spring with an idea. We came back together this fall to further discuss, and here we are today. Race and resistance, understanding Bermuda today. We talked a lot about how to frame this conference and decided to ask everyone the same question. Define resistance in the context of the time period and the area of expertise that you have. It's a deceptively simple question because in many cases, the presenters have to creatively discuss centuries of work and numerous concepts in a relatively short period of time, 10 minutes. Our historians, in fact, and I'm sure Mr. Jar Dr. Jarvis feels this way, probably feel like this is the conference version of speed dating. The conference easily could have been held on any one of the time periods. We acknowledge that. <laughs> He's nodding. Nevertheless, our presenters have the license and the academic freedom to approach their answer however they see fit, and we are all here to learn. So, what is resistance? How do we define resistance? According to Freud, resistance refers to oppositional behavior when an individual's unconscious defense of the ego, self, are threatened by an external source. So usually it is a form of blocking that is not accepting, not assimilating. And this blocking is healthy, especially when we're talking about the context of racial issues. For me, resistance in the context of racial issues is about responding in a healthy manner to feelings of cognitive dissonance, that means not assimilating or not accepting things that you feel are hurtful or just wrong in one's environment and making intentional decisions not to conform even when your behavior is contrary to social norms or what is socially accepted. These resistance behaviors lead to changes in one's environment or circumstances for the better not just for the individual but for others. Our history, Bermuda's history, is punctuated with moments or periods of resistance that transformed Bermuda in a series or pattern 
of resistance and plateaus. That simply means that we have moments of resistance, times when something is changed, followed by nothing, and then a period of change, and then again a plateau. Michel Foucault said the following, the work of an in intellectual is not to mold the political will of others. It is, through the analysis that he does in his own field, to re-examine evidence and assumptions, to shake up habitual ways of working and thinking, to dissipate conventional familiarities, to reevaluate rules and institutions, and to participate in the formation of a political will where he has a role as a citizen to play. And I would add to that, to encourage resistance. With that said, I look forward, like all of you, to hearing today's presenters. Again, welcome to everyone and enjoy the day. Next, I welcome Dr. Wale Adabanwe and Dr. Stephen Tuck of Oxford University. Good morning, everyone. My, uh, I must confess that I'm struck by the fact that the audience actually responds. This is great. I have never experienced that anywhere in the world. So this is remarkable. Uh, I am the uh, Rhodes Professor of Race Relations at uh, Oxford University and the director of the African Studies Center. I'll let my colleague introduce himself before I go on. Okay. Yes, hello. Good morning as well, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Tuck, and I'm a professor of modern history at Oxford University and also involved in the Race and Resistance Research Group, which is based at Torch, the one with the uh, colorful squiggly logo there. So, uh, so we bring you uh, greetings from the intellectual center of the empire, which uh, <laughs> which we are gathered here to resist. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are very happy to, to be here, and uh, we, we were quite glad when uh, this initiative started, and I think it was supposed to be held earlier in the year, and then it was shifted, uh, so it's really a great pleasure. Uh, yesterday we visited two schools, and we had a very nice time discussing with uh, young people. Um, just... I. My colleague will give more substantial, you know, um, talk about uh, the our involvement in this conference. But I just have um, a an announcement. Uh, we are hosting a conference on racialization and the publicness in Africa and the African diaspora in Oxford uh, in June 2019. Uh, we we'll sent around some of the. So it will be. So we are actually also. <laughs> Uh, starting to have a lot of resistance within the center of the, the intellectual center of the empire in itself. So we will we'll be glad, you know, if uh, some of you would be interested in uh, uh, coming to the conference. I, we've been passing around the information. I think uh, some of the uh, the announcement is also available, I think, around the, the book stand. So we really appreciate it if you uh, participate in the conference uh, next year in, in Oxford. Uh, again, thank you very much, and we're, I'm happy to be here. And I'd just like to add that I'm also delighted to be here. And uh, as an institution, we're, we're so happy to be involved and supporting this day. I'd like to thank our organizers and hosts, and actually to recognize the incredible hard work that's gone into putting this sort of day together, the persistence, the creativity, at times diplomacy, in bringing us all here. Um, also to say, uh, we're very fortunate at Oxford to have hosted a series of events on Bermudan history. I should say real Bermudan history. And uh, we've had a display of books on black Bermudan history by activists and historians, uh, many of whom are here today. And we had a talk by Reverend Kingsley Tweed, who came from London to Oxford and shared his own life story of resistance and the history of this island. The issues he raised then and the issues we're going to be discussing today, uh, as Wally has said, are the issues we're grappling with in Oxford too, as we deal with our own history and legacy of imperialism in our own institution and city. 
So uh, we really look forward to today, to learning more about the mutant history, and also to learning how to reckon with our shared histories as we grapple with our present and future. So thank you from both of us on behalf of our institution for allowing us to be involved and here today. Thank you. As uh, Dr. Tweed mentioned, today's event is not only a symposium, but of course also a celebration of the one and only Dr. Eva Hudson. <laughs> Activist, academic, writer, speaker, civil rights trailblazer, and a Bermudian living legend. I invite Mr. Cordell Riley of Citizens Uprooting Racism in Bermuda, CURB, who will give tribute to Dr. Hudson. Good morning, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to be asked to give a tribute to whom I can only describe as a living legend. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. There is much I can say about Dr. Eva Hudson. I can speak about her numerous academic achievements. I can speak about her role in amalgamating, amalgamating the white and black teachers unions. I can speak about her fight to obtain gainful employment in Bermuda. I can talk about the writing of her seminal book, Second Class Citizens, First Class Men and of course, her nearly eight decades of being involved and being the voice for racial justice and black economic empowerment in Bermuda. But all of that is written in your program. So you can read all of that. So I think what I'll do is spend the six minutes that I've been given to talk about my own personal experiences with Dr. Eva Hudson. And it goes back nearly four decades ago. And I've told her this story, although she says she doesn't remember. If she hasn't been one thing, she has been consistent. And 40 years ago, she was giving a talk at the then Warwick Secondary School. And in that talk, she spoke about the importance of owning your own home. And there I was, a young lad, listening and taking in every word as to why it is important to own one's home. Well, Dr. Hudson, I can tell you 40 years later, that seed that you planted in me has come to fruition. Let's bring it up now to 2012, when Curb was taking a delegation to the oddly named White Privilege Conference in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where Lynn and I, Lynn Winfield and I, were giving a talk on structural racism in Bermuda. And on that trip was none other than Dr. Eva Hudson. And she said to me, you know, I'm really motivated to find a tool that will help us deal with internalized racism. And so I said, OK, well, let's see what we can find. And we attended a workshop. She won't remember this, because neither do I. But I went last night, and I actually found a program. I went online, it was in the program, and we attended this workshop, and it was titled, The People of Color Identity Development, White Supremacy and Internalized Racial Oppression. And there was a caution there that this com that, that seminar was only for people of color. That's something I'll mention, bring, come back to in just a minute. And so we went to this session. And after that session, Dr. Hudson said to me, 
I think I found the tool that we can use for internalized racism. And she said to me, I want to hold a workshop on that, uh, on internalized racism, racism, so that we can help our people deal with our past hurts and oppression. So I said to her, Dr. Hudson, if you're going to hold a workshop, I'm going to help you with it. And so we came back, and I can't remember the tool that she, uh, we found, but we did some research, and Curb organized a workshop at the Leopards Club. And Dr. Hudson had only intended for it to be one session. And we went there, and we had about 40 people uh, in attendance, and we sat in a circle, and we utilized the technique, and that was it. But the audience said, what do you mean that's it? You can't start something and not finish it. And when we advertised for this, it was in the paper that it was for blacks only. Well, you can imagine <laughs> the pushback that we got. And so I said to Dr. Hodgson, I said, we ought to open this up because people are complaining and this and that, the other. And in true Dr. Hudson fashion, I got a stern rebuking. She said to me, you see, when white people push back, black people have a tendency to cave in. And so that was one of my first lessons working with Dr. Hudson. And so we decided, based on the audience response, that we would continue these workshops. And I remember she's, at that stage, in her 80s, driving herself, people wanting to have this workshop continue. And so we met at the Lepix Club, and she said to me, as long as people come, I will be there. And so for the next six weeks, we started off with 40, and then by the time we got to the six weeks, six week, it was Dr. Hudson and I in the room at 7 o'clock, looking at each other. And then at 7.30, one other person shows up. And we said, well, that was the end of that. But that demonstrates her commitment in this struggle for racial justice and black economic empowerment. That even although she is in her and I know we're not supposed to tell a woman's age, but in her 95th year, she is still soldiering on and doing whatever she can to help her people. And for that, we are internally grateful. I want to leave a quote from somebody who's not necessarily known in the racial justice arena, Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah said this, I am where I am because of the bridges I, that I have crossed. Sojourner Truth was a bridge. Harriet Tubman was a bridge. Ida B. Wells was a bridge. Madam C.J. Walker was a bridge. Fannie Lou Hammer was a bridge. And to this, I add, Dr. Even Hodgson is a bridge that I have crossed, and many of you in this room have also crossed this bridge. Thank you very much. For our next tribute to Dr. Hudson, please join me in welcoming Mr. Roger Denbrook, performing artist who will perform a monologue with excerpts from Storm in a Teacup and Second Class Citizens, First Class Men. Bermuda's policy of segregation was intended to ensure that black Bermudians believe themselves to be as innately and inevitably inferior and powerless as the Bermudian oligarchy made certain that they were economically, politically, 
and socially. The deliberate and determined policy of segregation can only be fully appreciated by those who have experienced it. Bermudians, for example, were not allowed to use the tennis stadium built with public money because they would apparently pollute it for whites. Black Bermudians were not allowed to use the Bermuda Public Library. Black Bermudians were excluded from all white color jobs in the government and in the private sector, with the exception of teachers in black schools and any black person who, through hard work or miracles, could become a doctor or a lawyer. There was total separation and segregation in churches and places of entertainment. Black people, black Bermudians could not enter hotels or restaurants, and the stores that they could enter ensured that they would always end at the back of any queue, no matter when they might have arrived, to segregate, to separate, to ensure that black and white Bermudians had totally divergent experiences and self-interest was the goal. Those experiences, those experiences would later be seen as superior and inferior. Black and white Bermudians often had no concept of how the other lived, unless there were blacks who worked as maids or handymen in white kitchens or on white grounds. Education was totally segregated. The Board of Education believed that trying to educate some people was like knocking their head against a stone wall. Black Bermudians were meant to believe that they were uneducable. It was only a few years after the emancipation of the black man that James Christie Easton, Chief Justice and President of the Council of Bermuda made an impassioned plea to provide at least a minimum of education for the free Negro as a moral obligation and as a self-interested necessity to the white wealthy former slave owners. James Christie Easton argued his case well. However, he didn't convince the government, as he had attempted to, that they must be educated in a manner that's equal to whites. The decision had been made that while the children of slaves must become citizens, they must become second class citizens. Second class education therefore became and remained essential in Bermuda. The first essential of a segregated education Apologies, the first essential of a second class educational system is a segregated pattern. Hence, education in Bermuda became and remained segregated. Cinemas, of course, were also segregated. One, the opera house was not segregated because it was owned by one of the black friendly societies. The other, the playhouse, was segregated with whites sitting upstairs and downstairs in the center and blacks sitting downstairs on the outsides. The Island Theater was built later. There, whites sat upstairs and the coloreds sat downstairs. With colored children complaining that those who sat upstairs would often spit on them. The stupidity of the policy of racial segregation was occasionally underscored when, as in South Africa, one sibling would be sold a ticket for the colored section. During the war, when everybody had to have an identity card, one member of the family could have their card stamped as white, while another would have their stamped as colored. It's important to recognize that racial segregation is a social phenomenon, socially determined. It's not a biological one. 
Black and white Bermudians have never been physically separate since the days of slavery, but when white men lay with black women and black women bore their half-caste children, this was not integration. When black women would nurse and care for white children of white wives and cook meals in their kitchens, this was not integration. Some blacks insist on the occasional interracial marriage or the legitimate children of mixed blood as integration, but not all of these children were legitimate. And even when they were, they were not in and of themselves indications of an integrated society. Black men and white men, black men and white men built ships together, sailed together, fished together, and farmed together. But this was obviously not integration. Integration should have meant black sharing proportionately in the wealth and power of Bermuda. Genuine integration would have meant a slight numerical majority of blacks in every aspect of the society, not just in prisons, but in managerial roles, political roles, as well as in financial and laboring roles. This isn't exactly the case. Apologies, I forgot to put my notes on the podium. Thank you. The formation of political parties and the institutionalized divisiveness among a people who did not need it gave whites a wonderful opportunity to invite blacks to join them, to integrate, while still retaining control over events. And there were those blacks who did join them and felt that they were truly integrated. The Bermudian society in terms of race has changed dramatically. Nevertheless, the racial and social stratification in very fundamental ways has not changed. Throughout Bermuda's history, there have been men and women who stood against the unjust social and racial reality that they found themselves in bringing criticism, resentment, and resistance against them. In 2018, the solutions are probably now more difficult. And the solutions will probably bring even more criticism and more resentment and more resistance. But it is the only path that will lead to greater social and racial justice in our country and will give us the less violent society that we deserve. Thank you. I now welcome Ms. Lisa Reed, Executive Officer of the Human Rights Commission. On behalf of the Human Rights Commission, I wish to reinforce my appreciation for this significant convening. A special thank you to our partners for your commitment to ensuring this wonderful opportunity to collaborate today. Before we begin, I invite us all to hold a moment of silent reflection. I invite you to close your eyes if you are comfortable to do so. Let us send gratitude and love to our ancestors, ancestors, to those whose story has been silenced, stolen, and denied, to all those who came before. Let us give thanks for today's gathering for the chance to be present, curious, and urgently engaged. And especially for the opportunity to learn from and with each other. Thank you. <laughs> 